uh, what I will try to do is to talk about the overview of myopia and options as an intervention. So uh, some of the options are very available in, in most part of the world, but we do understand uh, due to regulatory, uh, some lenses like auto key lenses are, are not uh, available in, in Thailand at, at this point in time. So uh, then we will talk about other options as well, uh, which is you know, later I'll share a bit more uh, some of these options uh, that I think is probably more practical for Thailand market. So by 2050, uh, we talked a lot about these numbers. So half of the world's population, what will happen by 2050? So we will probably have like a you know, 5 billion kind of people, but then almost 50%, you know, half the world population will be myopic. Okay, and almost one people, one billion people will have high myopes, which is we are talking about minus five diopes and above. So we are looking at a pretty serious condition whereby uh, some countries will probably suffer more from this uh, statistics. Uh, some countries will do better in terms of a uh, lower myopic uh, condition in 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 the, within the population in the country itself. But again, as you look at across the board, uh, every country will probably uh, have a high incidence of myopia in, in within the country itself by 2050. Uh, partly, you know, a lot is probably driven by digital devices. You know, close uh, contact with digital devices on children that will really worsen the myopic condition of of the population as a whole. So this is a is an issue that uh, uh, eye care practitioner or the industry player we are all looking at and you know possibly hope hopefully to control. Uh, this down as well. Uh, if you could uh, mute your mic because I'm also hearing echo coming from uh, Sorry, if uh, if you can, do help me mute the and, Um. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'm hearing myself. Uh, it's, a, it's a lag delay, so I'm, I'm hearing myself on the microphone. So thank you so much for helping me to mute your mic. Thank you. Okay, I'll just continue going on. So uh, it's, it's an issue that we all have to grapple with and to probably find some solution out of it as well. Okay, so I, as all myopia, there is some risk factors, you know, like age, younger than 13 years old, and there's a history of family, fa family history of one myopic parent, likelihood the child will be myopic as well. And also, Child, children are getting less and less outdoor timing, time, play time, you know, or, or just spending less outdoor. Uh, so again, it, it will worsen the myopia condition as well. Uh, time spent on near work, whether it's on uh, books or on digital devices, that will also worsen the condition. And of course, reflective error, less plus reflection than expected for age. Okay, uh, you know, that will also not be another factor for worsening of myopic condition. Okay, if you see the graph here, you see if two parents are myopic, you see the probability of the child uh, being myopic is, very, is much higher than a uh, parent that is not myopic. So again, these are the factors that we all have to look at uh, and also to probably work along to reduce the rate of myopia in, within the country or in, in uh, the practice that we practice with or the patients that we deal with as well. Okay, and a bit more reflective error in detail. Young children are expected to be hyperopic, and the expected normal is plus one at six years of age. So less plus refraction, like I said earlier, for expected age is a risk factor for myopia. So if you look at the chart there, you know, depending on age, so you have less plus, uh, you tend to have a higher incident of developing myopia at an early stage or a younger age. Okay. So, uh, and the younger the child becomes myopic, the faster they will progress in terms of the myopia progression. So, for example, onset of seven years old, they will progress by 0 0.9 adopters every year. See, let's say the child onset at 12 years old with myopia condition, they progress at a 0 0.3 adopters per year. So again, if you do your math, if you add those numbers up every year, 0 0.9 or 0 0.3, it becomes a very high myopic at maybe 15 years old or 16 years old, which is something that we know, or you could uh, know you have a reflective error of minus six diopters uh, no, by 16 years old. So this is something that we want to reduce or to manage uh, or to control you know, as, as we talk about it. And what happens in the myopia control progression? Next part is 
The fastest rate of reflective change in myopia children occurs in the year prior to onset. So if you look at the chart here, so this is the onset year, but prior to onset, you see the biggest rate of reflective error jumping. So this is the part where actually don't wait for uh, the child to have reflective error before the onset preventive measure can be done. Okay, so and this is the important point that uh, as an eye care practitioner, possibly when we look at our patient, we have to look at them differently. And a child who is less hyperopic than normal age should be also be closely monitored. And of course, there's greater need if other risk factors are involved, like diet, premature uh, babies. They are pre the child is a premature baby, so something to be monitored on. And uh, less light exposure to UV uh, ray, you know, UV light. So these are indo a lot indoors. So these are the other risk factors that uh, have been considered when slowing the myopia progression of a child. So I, a lot of this has been talked about. What are the myopia risks? Glaucoma, of course, open angle, cataract, you know, early, earlier to be involved in, in having cataract situation. Uh, we, things like retina tearing due to the higher myopes, uh, leading to a more serious condition like retina detachment. Of course, also we have talked about uh, myopic macular degeneration. So these are you know, all the risks. It magnify you know, with a higher myopes. So you see, you know, the, 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 the risk level increases with a higher diopes. So again, it's important to slow down or to reduce the progression of myopes in a child. So the quick summary, less than 0.075 diopes of manifest hyperopic at age 6 to 7 is the most significant factor for future myope. Okay, and essentially, any myopic child is a progressor until proven otherwise. So basically, this is an important point. So any child you know, that comes to your practice today is basically a progressor until proven otherwise. So we are you know, saying any, any kids that come to your child, they will definitely progress in a myopic condition you know, until you do certain things that is differently from what they are doing today. And the institution of myopia control strategy as early as possible is really evidence-based practice. So don't be afraid to tell your patient to start uh, a myopia control uh, in some way as early as possible. Uh, it's not frightening your patient, but really this is an evidence-based practice and it's important, especially you know, by the age of age nine years. So you can actually start uh, a form, any form of myopia control strategy. Later on, I have a slide on that to talk about what are the strategy that you can involve in uh, getting uh, a myopia control strategy uh, implemented. So if I'm going to look at individual practices as a whole, you know, uh, what is the current actual myopia practice? So we have myopia control, contact lens, single vision. So what will be the portion of that you know, falling into place? So the big gray area is single vision lens. So I would say majority of practitioners today, you know, in most part of the country, uh, I'm sure in Thailand as well, uh, most easiest way to treat children in myopia is single vision spectacle lens. So that's a big part of it. Okay. And then maybe some, you know, will treat with uh, contact lenses. So fit the child with contact lenses, the smaller portion of it. But really, how many practices will really embark on the myopia, actively embarking on the myopia control uh, strategy or myopia control uh, practice in, within the practice itself? So the blue part, really very small. But again, I know that blue part is small. That means we have a blue ocean there that we can actually expand this part within our practice itself. Can we do better? Can we enlarge our myopia control practice you know, to be a bigger portion within our practice itself? So this is a question that you know, all of us, you know, uh, as a practitioner, we have to ask as the industry, how can we also influence that as well? So uh, again, another important point to think about you know, now, do we want to start more myopia um, uh, control as part of practice? So the goal of myopia management is really to reduce exile elongation as much as possible during the development of the myopia. So an exile elongation is really as associated with retinal pathology. So uh, at the end of the day, whatever strategy we are implementing, uh, we want to reduce the exile elongation as much as possible when the, the child starts to have an onset of development of reflective error. 
Uh, you can actually take note of this. There are some multiple management resources. I'm quoting this uh, from uh, Brian Holden Vision Institute. So uh, there's a link there. The global my myopia center dot org myopia resources myopia guideline. So uh, you can write this down, and uh, uh, hopefully our videos are recorded. So later on we can share this video as well if you want to take a look. Uh, we can sign up there, and actually with that you can actually key in your patient age and the current myopia, and then it, there's a very nice map to show uh 12 years old, 13 years old likelihood of where your patient myopia will be at. And you can use this to actually to talk to your patient, say, hey, potentially your risk four years down the road when your child is 12 years old or 16 years old, we are looking at myopes of minus four, minus three, minus six, for example. So it's a very good tool to actually uh, to explain to the parents and also uh, make the parents more actively involved in having a myopia control strategy uh, implemented. So it's, it's not enough just having the practitioner telling the parents, but the parents must also be able to see that very clearly. So um, things like that, uh, which is really important, uh, you can actually use it uh, uh, to, use, to, to have, have that. So uh, some of the assessment or risk I explained a lot, like parental myopia, uh, reflective error, near work use, outdoor time limited. So what's the increased risk of progression? So these are all uh, there. So it's actually a good tool to use as a reference point in your practice if, if you want to use that, okay? But as a myopia control management, uh, what can be done uh, or what we, we can have a status quo situation as well. So if you have no myopia control strategy, so basically the, so uh, if you don't do that, what do you do? Uh, at least do increase outdoor timing, tell the, the, the child to have more outdoor timing have more regular frequent breaks from near work. But let's say you have, uh, there's no, no myopia part, okay? So you, you, you do all this to reduce the risk when the, the onset of myopia is not there. But let's say there's myopia starts to take place. So probably we need to consider a, a myopia control strategy involved, uh, looking at patient suitability, what is the risk of progression, uh, or looking at what is the uh, patient career preference, you know, the effectiveness of the strategy, and ability to assess to the strategy, it could be finances ability to assess this, because some of this uh, uh, strategy involve buying certain, uh, you know, the parents have to pay for certain things, which uh, might be difficult as well. And also an assess to the strategy could be regulatory in the, within the market as well. Okay, so if in that strategy, you have no control, uh, like the map that I have earlier, basically using a single vision spectacle lenses, okay, or uh, single vision contact lenses. Okay, basically not having any control. Let's say if you want to do a more active control to reduce the onset of progression in your in your patients, uh, what what are the uh, options available? Uh, if you look at contact lenses, okay, we can have like a myopia focal light, uh, uh, like center distance kind of a contact lens to to use as a myopia control lens, or you can have like a extended depth of focus. Uh, contact lens, which uh, Jerry will talk a bit more. Of course, there's auto K lenses uh, available in a lot of markets, but uh, in, in Thailand, unfortunately, it's not available yet. Uh, and of course, you have progressive additional spectacle. Uh, people from Essilor, from Kauzai, they have it, myoplugs, myovision. This is another example. So, uh, of course, you have executive biofocus. So, the efficacies of all these examples, uh, some are really high in terms of efficacy. Some are really uh, mixed, uh, better than have nothing. You can try some of this option. So things like a peripheral defocal, atropine, of course, is a very effective uh, way of uh, controlling, but then there's a limits on how it can be used. And now, of course, you can have a combination of both low dose atropine and also uh, with the usage of contact lenses, whether it's the EDOF lenses or even auto K lenses. Okay. So if I look at what are the efficacy of the different options. So if you look at using a uh, like a myopia control kind of a spectacle lens, we're looking at probably 29 to 45% of efficacy. Um, basically the whole principle of using things like that, uh, 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 myopia control spectacle lens is reduce a community flag or reduce hyperopic peripheral defocus. So there's an element of peripheral defocus going on in those kind of uh, spectacle lenses. 
Um, so it is simple, non-invasive, no rebound effects, and it's also you know the few of a uh, few of you is good. Uh, no, few of you is not so good. And of course, it's have, have an element of a bifocal in it, so the the vision uh you no know, could uh in somewhat uh be not as good. So they have things like multifocal soft contact lenses. So you might be looking at forty nine percent efficacy. Uh, again, working on the principle of a hyper big uh peripheral defocus, a wide field of view. Uh, good look good. You can play sports on that as well. But it might have a lower quality vision because of uh, of the uh, the ad being built into the the the, the uh, vision optics. So and also uh, wearing contact lens, you have a small risk of microbial keratitis. Um, if you have dry eyes, then it might not be so suitable. Things like auto K again, auto K has a very high uh, it's forty three now percent, but then the other studies show that it's a very high efficacy, as close as sixty to seventy percent, depending on what kind of studies you're looking at. Again. You reduce uh, relative hyperopic peripheral defocus. Uh, no need to vary correction during the daytime. Wide view of view, good aesthetic, good in spots. But again, and other risks, the risks involved with wearing contact lens apply as well. Okay. Uh, and also, you might have a low quality of vision, particularly with large pupil. Okay. Uh, and of course, using atropine, which is uh, a lot of eye doctors prescribe that. So it's a well known mechan. Uh, it's a good mechanism. Uh, uh, used in a lot of countries, uh, it reflects the eye focusing mechanism by disabling it. It's a very good myopia control tool, uh, and likely to have good VA when used with a uh, single vision correction aid. But again, the drawback of that is the downside of any treatment sometimes is that the duration of treatment cannot be too long, the dosage cannot be too high, okay, and it can dilate the pupil. So uh, again, uh, these are some of the things. Uh, that have to be looked at. And also, we do see studies after atropine is being discontinued, the rebound gets also uh, quite rapid as well in terms of the myopia of correction. So something that we have to look at. So having said all this, what are the options available within the country itself that we probably have to look at and to say what is sensible and what's not sensible. So things like spectacle lens is really good, easy to use. Uh, auto K lens, getting product regulatory might be a challenge, okay? Uh, something had to be worked at. Of course, uh, eye doctors use atropine. Depending if you are eye doctor or depending on regulatory, some uh, uh, eye care practitioners and optometrists are not allowed to use uh, atropine. So again, depending on the local uh, regulatory situation in terms of applying uh, drugs uh, to the patient. So the next part we want to talk about is uh, EDOF. So uh, EDOF is really a, a a good lens in terms of uh, as a myopia control tool. So it's really easy to fit versus auto K lenses and it has demonstrated myopia control efficacy. Provide better vision versus uh, multifocal contact lens for my young myopes. Excellent aesthetic, you know. Uh, it's reversible and it's one day disposable and it's also an excellent fast free option for young myopes. And another point here is, uh, I didn't put that down, uh, because EDOF is used as a press biopia lens mainly, uh, and use and then for myopia control or myopia strategy is used as an off-label uh, lens. Uh, to get that approved in Thailand is actually a lot more easier. Uh, you know, which probably is is probably more positive as a press biopia lens and use it as a off-label. Uh, myopia control lens uh, usage within the clinic practice. So there's probably a much better and much uh, effective way of having some level of a myopia control to being put into the hands of Thai, uh, uh, Thai optometrists uh, or Thai eye care practitioners with like a lens like an EDOF. So uh, Jerry will talk more a lot of that as well later on. We'll look through the science behind EDOF before we get to know how SID one day EDOF lens designs suitable for press biopic patients. We will then move to another age group how we use EDOF in myopia management. I have some clinical studies to share with you all. EDOF means the design intends to extend the focus depth and increase the range that human eye can see. EDOF technology is now widely accepted and fitted by the ophthalmologists. In the IOL industry, there are low additional power, spatial diffractive designs, special diffractive designs, sphere aberrations control, 
and pinhole, all these lenses can be called EDOF lens. Recently, there is a EDOF contact lens named Natural View, which is made by America company, which is central distance design. However, this lens was approved as myopia control lens, not for press PR patients. Here is a simple picture that shows the optical system of single vision. You can see after the refraction from the lens, the light will focus on the focal plane. The range in the yellow color means the depth of focus. It is narrow. When we look at distance, a perfect acuity is seen at the distance focal point. Due to the shallow depth of focus, Everything from near to intermediate remains blurry. When we read at arm length, the letters are in focus. You can still see the objects around the book, but it's not as sharp as the letters. This is what we call depth of focus. Another question comes in, can we increase the range of focus? Can we extend the depth of focus? The most simple EDOF design, which we all know is bifocal design, which sets two power on the optical zone, which provide distance and near vision in one lens. When the difference between the distance and near is bigger than 0.5 adapter, usually the intermediate quality of vision will decrease. So we'll see uh, more deeper into seed one day pure EDOF lens design. Brian Holden and Seed have developed and commercialized an algorithm that unlocks the full potential of optical characteristics and visual properties. By applying this algorithm to the lens design, EDOF lens are able to minimize variability in visual performance overcoming the limitation of traditional multifocal contact lens and providing a good options for myopia management. EDOF also provides a good perceived image quality under a broad range of conditions. In EDOF, in C EDOF lens, there are three individual lens designs with three edition power, plus 075, the low edition, plus one, 5, the middle edition plus 225 the high edition. This diagram shows a periodic rings in it. Non-monotonic designs, which means the power distribution is not increasing or decreasing in a consistent way. So when you look at this diagram, try to recall the physics theory on light refraction. When a light wavefront passes through a lens, it will reflect towards the focal point. The depth of focus is limited and shallow. What we apply in C EDOF lens is actually manipulating a few higher order aberration, reflecting from the lens and focus on the focal points as well. By using this method and referring to the principle of interference, they are able to focus on the focal points in the red line. And this is how the depth of focus is extended. With the extended depth of focus, it is likely to have a more balanced visual performance from far to near. It is less likely to be affected by pupil size changes and decentration. This is the comparison of different designs of multifocal contact lens, which easily be affected by different conditions. So this is another uh, uh, studies that uh, done by Brian Holden. Brian Holden, uh, we see we look at the effect of pupil size on optical performance. Different line color represents different pupil size. So you can see the E of lens is less affected by the pupil size. So whether they look at uh, if, uh, far or near, or the pupil size change from uh, uh, small to bigger. 
So the retinal image quality remains high in three different designs too. Same goes to decentration on the EDOF optical performance. So EDOF lens are able to give the uh, higher retinal image quality in low, mid, high. So this is the visual performance illustrations when the patients wear EDOF lenses. So from far to near, there is a well balance of vision quality. So there are three lens designed for three different depth of focus ranges. Each design features extended depth of focus and provides the power distribution needed to give a more balanced image quality from near to far. It is a true extended depth of focus lens rather than classifying it as central distance or central near lens design. A lens which high depth of focus offers the widest range of depth of focus. The perceived image quality is best with the low depth of focus type. So do you remember what EDOF stands for? The EDOF lens provides a good retinal image quality at all distances throughout the range of depth of focus. It is a true EDOF design which can provide press biopia patients with continuous and stable quality of vision. EDOF lens strongly defends the effect of pupil size. The vision is stable with lens decentration. So let's see how EDOF can act as a myopia control lens by using the middle uh, addition power. So uh, these are the famous myopia management in the industry. Some practitioners are using the spectacles, uh, contact lenses either in soft type or rigid type. And some uh, doctors to use atropine to uh, reduce the myopia progression. And the extended depth of focus can be up to 72 uh, efficacy in reducing the myopia progression. So this is uh, what we already know in myopia management so far. At birth, the optics of an eye is not matched to its axial length. The kids will have a process called emetropization by homeostatic growth control mechanism. If any failure of this will result in refractive error. It is suggested that the multifocal contact lens would give a peripheral myopia defocus, which is a potential way to slow down the myopia progression. So in myopia management, the peripheral hyperopic defocus could trigger the axial length growth. Even in auto care treatment, they suggest that this will shift the hyperopic defocus back towards the retina. So a plus lens could induce a myopic defocus. So let's look at the clinical studies. So there have been uh, three studies uh, uh, conducted. The first study, they will look at the visual performance acceptability uh, in one week dispensing. So they will uh, look at the subjective uh, vision and their feedback. And the second studies will be the myopia progressions. They will observe the two years efficacy. And the third studies will be the myopia progression in six months comparative, uh, which involves three groups of people wearing a single vision lens. Okay, uh, one eye is single vision lens, the other eye could be a multifocal lens. So in study one, they started collecting data from participants, had them to wear four types of uh, lenses in random, 
So they will collect the data and do the necessary checking. And also after seven days, they will collect the subjective response. So in case there is any uh, drop up or uh, suddenly stop, they will repeat or even wash out. So they collected the data. So the yellow color and the orange color represents the EDA of lenses. Okay, so you could see that the overperformance uh, actually the EDA of lenses perform better than my site and Proclear. So in another study, which involved uh, 523 part participants, which involved the young, young myopes children. So these are the test contact lens they will use, have them to wear a different lenses and single vision at X and the control lens. So they will progress the studies uh, with two year follow up. So the reduced hyperopic defocus meaning that uh, they, did, they did not reveal uh, what type of multifocal lens. So, but this is the multifocal lens with different designs and this is the EDOF lenses design. So middle and uh, low edition. So they have uh, shown the uh, results, axial length and spherical equivalent respectively. So the data shows that the axial length progression and spherical uh, equivalent in uh, using the EDOF lens has significantly slowed the myopia progression. So in terms of subjective uh, results, the, their feedback, the EDOF lenses actually perform similar to single vision lenses, which means the young uh, kids can accept the vision quality in EDOF if they wear single vision comparing. So there is no issues of uh, switching them from single vision lens to EDOF lenses. So there is some um, uh, drop up cases from the uh, numbers of participants. So the time and job conflict, which uh, could be the main issues for the drop up cases and others is not stated. So in summary, for, from the study two, the eat of content lens shows a significant myopia control efficacy compared to single vision control contact lens. The myopia control efficacy is not significantly different between the two EDOF designs. The visual equity reduction with EDOF lenses is actually less than one line. And the subjective vision is no difference between EDOF lenses and the single vision control contact lens. In study number three, they involved 95 participants, also uh, young kids. Test, uh, they have uh, three groups. The first group is wearing the uh, both eyes with single vision. So this is the baseline. So they will come back follow up in the first six months and the 12, six, uh, 12, uh, second six months. In group three, they will have uh, one eye wearing the single vision and the other eye uh, wearing the my sight. While the group three is wearing the single vision and the other eye is wearing the EDOF lenses. So after the six month, they will actually switch the uh, lenses between the eyes. Meaning that the, if the initially uh, initial eye is wearing single vision, they will uh, wear the uh, EDOF lenses after six months. So this is the result uh, in the first six months after the first six months follow up. So in single vision, actually for, uh, there is a, a shown uh, that the axial length is uh, uh, elongating and the spherical equivalence is actually uh, become worsened. So with the my side or the EDOF lenses, actually there is still some efficacy. In my side, there is a 48%, around 40% of the efficacy, while the EDOF lenses has 63 and about 40% of efficacy in spherical equivalence. So let us look at the second six months if they are uh, about to switch on the contact lenses between the eyes. 
So uh, my side is still showing about the 30% to 42% efficacy, while the EDOF lenses, okay, showing the 64% and 66%, which means that uh, there's less uh, slowing with my side lenses in period two compared to period one. So the EDOF lens performs seeming, uh, similarly, uh, either regardless of time frame. So in summary, uh, EDOF lens is confirmed a potential and solution for myopia control because they, they demonstrated the myopia control efficacy and it provides better vision uh, if compared to the traditional multifocal contact lens for young myopes. So this is the EDOF lens specifications. So this is a hydrogel lens, daily lens, diameter, uh, center thickness, base curve is 8.4, and the water content is 58%. A decay of T for the 2.9. The spherical power okay, is plus 5 to minus 12. And each power is in increment is in 0.25 steps. Three uh, designs, low, middle, high. And there is 32 lenses in the box. So this is the lens marking. All right. So thank you for your time for this topic. Now I will show you a video uh, of the interview of a uh, of uh, eye care practitioner in Australia, Dr. Oliver Wu. Okay, so um, Dr. Oliver he Wu here, Dr. Hello. Oliver Wu from um, Sydney, Australia. Uh, he's one of the very experienced fitters uh, in Australia, and uh, I'm very privileged to have him to share a little bit about his experience with the EDOF lens. So, um, Dr. Wu. How long have you used the seed EDOF lens for? Oh, probably about five or six months since the beginning of this year. Yeah, the really, really good lenses. Uh, yeah, good to have uh, extra option lenses in my practice uh, for, uh, for my patient needs, in visual needs. Oh, excellent. Okay. So how have you found the lens in terms of comfort and vision so far? So far, the comfort, the vision, uh, I would say... Probably 80, 90% of them are really happy with the comfort, uh, with the visions. Depends on what I use it for. Okay? Probably we, we know either of lenses can have lots of different options in uh, fitting uh, the vision needs or some special requirements that yep, we can use for it. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so which patients are the ones that you fit the either of lens for at the moment? Um, currently, I fit in like uh, presbyopic, like uh, either we know is more for presbyopia, and also I use it for uh, my myopia management uh, use for the kids. But I uh, have to make sure we know this thing that I use it as an off label usage for the myopia management. Yep. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And uh, what about the success rate? How are you finding that for your presbyopia and myopia management? Um, for the presbyopia, uh, we're really happy. Seriously, we're happy with the success, right? Uh, like I said to a lot of our friends, uh, make sure you follow the fitting guy. So <laughs> if you follow the fitting guy, the success rate uh, is pretty high. Uh, I would say for the presbyopia, probably close about probably 70, 80%. Okay. The success rate quite good and people are quite happy. And need a bit more chair time to fine tune a bit of the, uh, like the extra 025, a little bit high and I mean mid, low, a little bit of chair time. Uh, probably I would say sometimes I need about two to three visits to get them really, really uh, right. I think very similar to other multifocal soft content lenses, you need about two to three visits to make sure. And um, for the myopia management, uh, I'm pretty comfortable to use it as another option for my myopia management option for the kids. And so far, all the kids are really happy and uh, with the vision, with the comfort. And I would only can say it's a bit too early to, to, to say whether it's really, really uh, superior than the other options because I only use it for about four or five months. And we still need a lot of data, a lot of uh, clinical uh, numbers to tell how good the uh, EDOC lenses, like the CE lenses in the uh, marketing management bracket 
off-label use, okay? <laughs> Make sure you know what I'm talking about, off-label yes. use there. But it's so far so good. So far yeah. so good, I'm really happy with this, yeah. Okay, so would you say that the Eat Off Lens is a valuable addition to your practice? Yeah, I think not just to my practice, I think will be a really good available option for everyone can have access to this, to that practice in uh, both Prescopic side and myopia management side. And also really good lens that uh, you can add value to your practice and also be your practice from a different category. Okay. Yeah. Well, anything else you want to add? Um, yeah, I think uh, be more adventurous and uh, open your arms to, uh, to try different things, okay? And you will see more different well when you open your hands, open your arms to try different things. Good. Excellent. Well, okay. Thank you for your time. Thank you. No problem. Okay. Uh, look at the UV1. The steep RGP lenses. Throughout the presentation, I will do a brief introduction on RGP, how to select the suitable patients for RGP, and how to handle the RGP and the lens care system. We will focus on steep RGP, we name it UV1. We will look deeper into the lens design and materials. I will share how to fit with UV1 and share some troubleshooting. PMMA is an original RGP material because it uh, gives the good optical stability and durability. Slowly improvement of the materials from silicon acrylate to fluorosilicon acrylate, which improve the oxygen transmissibility and reduce the protein deposition. Some RGP lenses can have surface treatment. Some can include the tip and UV blocker. RGP actually brings a lot of benefits towards the wearer. It provides the excellent vision and correct most of the vision problems and even high aesthetic mechanisms or the initial stage of the carotid conus. It requires a short adaptation period and it is easy to put on and take care and comfortable to wear due to the size. So some practitioners are using it for myopia control as well. Uh, it is a, a, available in multi focus or bifocal design. It retains shapes and easy for handling. So it is suitable for those who cannot adapt to soft contact lens and it's durable and it does not have water content. Of course, there is some limitations for RGP, but this is all can be overcome. To maintain the adaptation, they require consistent uh, wear and due to the smaller size, some tend to slip off the center of the eye easily, but most of the wearers are comfortable with it. Sometimes the debris can get under the lens. So the lens maintenance is very important. They will require a regular office visit to check on their eyes condition and the lens conditions to make sure both are in a very good conditions. Here is some good points of soft and RGP lenses. You can uh, advise them depends on their lifestyle, occupations, working environments, eye conditions, because some uh, depends on their lifestyle. Some, if let's say they are actively, so you would recommend them a soft contact lens rather than RGP. So please select the patients wisely before you feed the RGP on the patients or recommending the GP lenses to potential patients because we do not want anything happen to their eyes. You will need to consider their optical indications, or either regular or irregular cornea astigmatisms, or high amounts of refractive errors, high astig. So in cratoconus patients, they are all a very good candidate to wear the GP lenses. Also, you need to be very sure that the patients do not have cornea injury or any infections on the lids or eyes infections. To, if they have dry eyes, please uh, treat the dry eye first. If they, ha they are developing the cataract, 
So you would recommend uh, surgery rather than replacing the new lenses to the patients. So make sure they do not have any inflammation of the eyes or, or the lids. And you will need to uh, look at their personal hygiene, whether they have a long nails. So this would be dangerous if they uh, accidentally poke their cornea. So your patient motivation can encourage them to be a very successful RGP virus, especially when it comes to cleaning parts. You can manage their expedition on the lens condition, performance and eye conditions because uh, maybe the soft lenses and the GP lenses, the price are a bit slightly different. So they will expect more from the GP lenses. So here are the two useful ways to put on and take off the lenses. This will require you as an eye care practitioner to teach them. So this might take some time and please be patient uh, with them. So to keep the lens condition good, we advise them to use the solution which is meant for RGP. You can get it from uh, Seed or Boston. Both are compatible uh, for RGP for UV1 as well. So now let me introduce the seed UV1 to you all. Seed UV1 is able to cut the harmful effects from UV radiation. UV rays can be divided into three types. UVC, which is completely absorbed by the ozone layer and atmosphere. UVB is mostly absorbed by the ozone layer, but some still reaching the Earth's surface. UVA is not absorbed by the ozone layer. In the market, there is some uh, non-UV cutting lenses, while seed UV1 can block 98% of UVB and up to 87% of UVA. So let us look at the experiments. The purple uh, part shows the corneal epithelial cells and uh, before and after exposure to the UV rays. After exposure to the UV rays, the, with the, in the lens, there is some uh, purple color, which means the cells in the lens, uh, or uh, there's still few cells are still surviving in the lens portion. If the patient is wearing UV1, the epithelial cells are almost all survive. This gives a very good protection to our eyes. Reef length, uh, which is shorter than 280 nanometer, are completely absorbed by the cornea. And reef length longer than 280 nanometer are mostly absorbed in the cornea as well. Only the remaining 1 to 2% of UV will still reaching the retina. So there will be the influence of UV radiation on eyes, such as ultraviolet keratitis, the inflammation of the cornea, and also develop, developing the cataract. So this is the designs of our UV1. So let's look at the lens and large view, especially on the bevel side. So there's an outer bevel and the inner bevel. So for the inner bevel, that is actually divided into two steps, which is center curve, periphery curve. So this makes the lens ultra smooth. So every blink, you are like, you are not wearing the contact lens. This floating bevel designs can actually help the tears, circulation, and keep your eyes moist and comfortable all day long. So for the health of the eyes, we stick to the lens preferability, a comfortable fit and protection from the UV rays. C UV1 is a well-balanced RGP lens designed by C. So this is the cross section of the lens. So this is the optical zones, inner and outer optical zones. The central thickness is 0 0.17 millimeter. And this is the lens diameter. So this is the lens specification, the lens material, okay, containing silicon and fluorine. The DK is 60, the central thickness is 0 0.17 at 3 diopter. 
So it contains the UV blocker. And the base curve is from 5 millimeter to 9 millimeter. With each increment is 0 0.05 step. And the diameter is 7.5 to 10 millimeter. Each increment is 0 0.1 step. And the power you can order is uh, plus 25 to minus 25. So before you fit the lens, you will require to check the refraction, the anterior segment of the eyes, and take some measurements, such as pupil size, pitch body, and visible palpable aperture. The pupil size uh, is to measure in normal and ambient light so that we know what is the maximum of uh, pupil size they will have. And the uh, back optical zone diameter should be greater 1 mm than largest pupil diameter. So in HVID, the total diameter should be 1.5 to 2 mm less than the HVID, which is uh, slightly smaller than the cornea. So if the lens is too large, it may induce a lead attachment. So we will see, uh, you will see the lens is uh, stationary at there. If the lead is too far from the limbus, it may induce the lens drooping. So after you feed the lens and let them uh, have the short adaptation, so you will insert the fluorescent and do the CLM examination. Usually we will uh, do two types of assessment, which is static assessment and dynamic assessment. In static assessment, we will see, uh, look at the lens, how it aligns to the cornea, what is their uh, alignment pattern. With normally positioned, the lens should not overlap the limbus and it should remain always remains at the center of the cornea. So in dynamic assessment, which means uh, the in dynamic, the meaning is lens movement. We will see how the lens move when blinking and after blink. Okay. And the uh, lens should remain on the cornea during all gaze position. So we will help the lids apart and we will look at the lens movement. It should be slowly descended downwards, but it remains at the center. So each time uh, you held a butt, they will they should back to the center position. This is the ideal fit. Well, this is the fluorescent pattern that you will see in uh, ideal fits, steep pattern or flat pattern. Okay, so in ideal fit, you can look at the edge leaf is uh, not too narrow, not too broad. And you can still see the pupil here. And the, there is a uh, tears underneath the lens. Okay, so in steep pattern, you will uh, not see the pupil and the edge leaf is very narrow, which means that uh, it is very tight on the cornea. And the central is pulling. In flat pattern, we will look at the central. Sometimes uh, it will be very dark color because it is uh, pressing on the cornea and the edge leaf is very broad and you cannot even differentiate the uh, brush, uh, the edge leaf. So in ideal RGP fit, it should be a slight apical clearance, the mid peripheral touch and a narrow band edge clearance at the periphery to allow the tears exchange. So in smooth vertical movement, it should be uh, about 1.0 1, 1 to 1.5 millimeter movement with each blink. This to ensure that the debris is removed and also the tears oxygen exchange. The patients uh, can tell you that uh, the region is stable and they feel uh, they do not have so much of lens sensation. So this is the examples of uh, flat feet characteristics. So the central is bearing, touching. So this could uh, lead to the corneal aberration in the center. And the edge leaf is very broad. You can see here, the fluorescent is channeling. And they can, uh, you can observe the excessive movement on the blinking or even very easily to drop out. They will complain that they have a very poor comfort and the vision is not consistent. 
So some will have an excessive tearing as well, even after adaptation. So in steep feet, the central pooling under the uh, lens in the center due to the excessive fluorescence and tears. So sometimes you can see a bubbles uh, in here, trapping it. Okay, and the uh, edge clearance is very, very narrow. And the movement you can actually uh, didn't see at all because it's very tight, sitting too tight on the corner, it don't move. Okay, so uh, some uh, will say that there is no lens saturation as well. Some even say that, oh, they feel comfortable with it. But you, when you look at the pattern, you know it's the pattern. So you will uh, do some changes on the lens diameter. So there is also a possibility of corneal uh, epithelial indentation uh, caused by the edge of the lens here. Just now the flat feet will be in the center and causes the corneal abrasion at the center. So when you observe there is a lens movement, either too much lens movement or too little lens movement, this is what you can change on the lens. So if you are about to increase the movement, which means that you see the movement is not, uh, is very little movement, okay? Which means the fitting is steep. So you will need to flatten the base curve or decrease the diameter. So if you see the movement, which is a very uh, excessive, you will need to decrease the movement by steepening the base curve or increase the total diameter. So there are there's some cases where you can uh, you will encounter if you straight away see this type of uh, pattern is uh, there's a bubble in the center and the narrow is uh, the actually it's very narrow. You straight away know that this is a, a steep pattern. You will straight away flatten the base curve. So in addition, you will, uh, if you encounter this type of patients, you will know straight away know this is a flat pattern. Okay, so center uh, there's so much, and especially the edge clearance that is very broad. You know that this is a flat pattern. You will straight away steepen steepen the base curve by one or uh, one or two steps. So in some cases, you will encounter uh, the cases like this, okay? So you might, might uh, know that oh, sometimes it's, you, you think this is a ideal pattern, okay? So you need to consider the lens movement, the centration, and their complaints about it. So you, maybe you can uh, try a flatter uh, base curve and compare which is the best result. So in cases of uh, less uh, decentration, you might uh, encounter some high or low riding lenses, okay? Which means high riding, which means that the lens is always sitting up, okay? So it suggests that it might be a stiff fitting or the uh, lens diameter is too large. So you need to uh, flatten the lenses to let uh, the lens comes down a bit, okay? Or reduce the diameter. Uh, reducing the diameter will be slightly flat, flatten the lens. All right. So for the low riding lenses, which means the lens is uh, always at the uh, inferior position of the cornea. So the lens may be too small. Okay. So we will increase the diameter. So in some cases, you will find that uh, it's continually uh, to one side, lateral decentration. So maybe the lens is too small or the lens is too flat or the corneal apex is actually uh, displaced like in some uh, cradle corneal patients, all right? So you can, you can increase the diameter or try and steepen the lens. If you find that the lenses is not moving at all, the lens is too steep and you need to flatten the lens. So in summary, RGB is an important sector for certain group of people. Although the market is uh, small, but it provides superior optics and durability and stability. So step-by-step -step lens care system to maintain the hygiene of RGP and since UV1 can cut off the harmful UV ray, and it has these unique designs to maximize the various comfort 
and give the good tear circulations. So thank you, and that's all from me.